The Lord Jesus Christ prophesied that in the end times, we see a repetition of the days of Lot. What was it about that time in Sodom and Gomorrah that gives us clues and previews of the Great Tribulation? And is there a new discovery that might give us even greater insight from the world of archaeology to confirm Bible prophecy and the accuracy of Scripture? Well, get ready to find out that and much, much more tonight with our special guest, Derek Gilbert, on Thursday Night Theology, which starts right now. Greetings and welcome to Thursday Night Theology. Uh, I am your host, Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim, The Final Nephilim, The Studies from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to talk about all that in a moment. But most importantly, this show is about you. This is a show where we try to explore the questions that are complex, mysterious, that get into the supernatural aspects of scripture, Bible prophecy, whether it's the Nephilim, the fallen angelic realm, the Antichrist, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the different mysteries that you might not hear in your church, we want to discuss it right here on Thursday Night Theology. We have a special show tonight. I'm really excited to introduce our special guest host for the for the night. Um, you know, I have to say that, you know, writing is not easy. Research and writing is not easy. And this man has done this <laughs> to a great extent. He is the author of Veneration, The Second Coming of Saturn. Uh, <laughs> the Last Clash of the Titans, and many, many other titles. He's the host on Skywatch TV. He's the host of Sci Friday, uh, View from the Bunker, uh, Five and Ten, and the list goes on. Uh, welcome to Thursday Night Theology, a great writer, author, researcher, speaker, friend, and very kind Christian man. Most importantly, Derek Gilbert. You are very kind. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Honored to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. It's great to have you, my man. Thank you so much for uh, coming on, for spending some time with the Thursday Night Theology audience. I can tell you right now that uh, there are a number of people who I know already have been bursting at the seams for this moment. So they're very happy. So, uh, so yeah, so thank you. And, um, you know, I really want to mention because, you know, I know you're never going to say it, but it's a lot of work. And I, I was very blessed and honored and privileged to be invited to come to Skywatch TV, to the studios, to work with, with you and the whole team, Joe Horn and everyone there and film some uh, some great shows, uh, some great episodes uh, that aired recently. And, you know, I was uh, in addition to the fact that it's such a quality production. I mean, everything is just this is. Just this is Hollywood level studio quality from front, just the whole thing. I was blown away. Just, you know, it's a lot of work. And I think people, they know you as like a, you know, as, as a host of shows and, and, and doing podcasts. But, you know, this is your job. I mean, you are there all day working, handling all sorts of things to make this production, including the whole team. So I just want people to know that it's a lot of work and you, you are very dedicated, sir. So I want to you know, just applaud you and give you your props because uh, people may not know behind the scenes the amount of work that goes into just making a half an hour of TV or, or radio. So uh, uh, I really well, I really salute you for that. That's true. And, you know, just give praise to God that uh, Tom Horn has been so faithful to bring together a, a team that uh, really complements each other well. Uh, and and we're, kind of, we're kind of in a, a transitionary period, uh, Sharon and, and me, that uh, with Tom's blessing, yes. we have uh, brought uh, Sci Friday back, a program that we started <laughs> without asking his permission <laughs> seven years ago. And uh, we are now uh, producing that every week, along with Unraveling Revelation, which you were kind enough to uh, guest on uh, some uh, a couple of months back. And uh, we're producing that under our own ministry banner. Now, we're not leaving Skywatch TV. I just was in on the panel uh, just uh, this uh, past week for a couple of programs with, uh, um, oh gosh, who was it? Uh, Carl Gallups and um, Terry James, and I'm going to forget the other gentleman, and uh, T uh, Tim Moore. Uh, so I was uh, there for that. I'll, I'll be sitting in on the panel again in a couple of weeks, and I'm still doing the 5 and 10, the daily news updates, but uh, most everything else is coming from home. In fact, we've even moved 5 and 10 to uh, 
our, our, our sitting room off of our master bedroom here at our house and set up a studio there because uh, as Skywatch TV has grown, they've had a need for uh, new staff. And uh, sure. really, uh, since we can do five and 10 from home and since I like my wife a yeah. lot, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to work from home. I mean, during the COVID lockdowns, we were like, oh, rats. <laughs> and I yeah. are home body. So um, they've got a new... Uh, uh, Brittany Jackson, who's doing just an amazing job with the social media there. And uh, she has now taken over what was my desk, my office there at Skywatch. But with Drew Graffia behind the scenes and Joshua yeah. Dorland, now John Anderson doing a lot of the editing. Um, and they're really working hard to put quality into every uh, production, every show, uh, not to just make it look good for the sake of looking good, but to help illustrate the messages that are being delivered. Because um, you can have a nice studio and you can have good camera work and all that. But uh, if you can illustrate what's being discussed, you know, and, and Sharon and I try to do that from home here when we're talking about, um, say, uh, events that took place in Israel thousands of years ago. It helps to put up a map. Where did this happen? So <laughs> we're, we're learning to do these things and we're, we're yeah. really doing it on a, a, uh, a shoestring budget. And, and really, for all of the quality that you see in the studio there, Tom Horn put money where it needed to be put. But we really do a lot very, very efficiently. And so uh, the the editing and the, the, the production quality that goes into Skywatch TV each week that Drew and John and Joshua are really responsible for, they're doing it on consumer-grade Macintosh computers. I mean, we're not using high-end Hollywood-style souped-up yeah, yeah. video editing machines. So uh, it's, yeah. it's all about yeah. being good stewards of what's been entrusted to us because what we do here what Tom and what the team at Skywatch do, what you do is in large measure dependent upon the generosity of people who um, support the work that we do. Exactly. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, there's so many times uh, people bring up finances and money and think that these are, you know, big, big multi-million dollar operations. And we're just as if, as if we're, you know, Paramount Studios or 20th Century Fox. It's not like that. It's really, like you said, it's really being good stewards and stretching yeah all the financing um, and everyone there is really putting in a lot of time and it's so important. It's so important and, well, you know, to get the message out. So we're serving our King. So, you know, what amen. better job can you have? Amen. Amen. You know, shot up from the rooftops, but you amen. know, if you, can, if you can broadcast it to 92 million homes, even better. <laughs> so, uh, so, so uh, before we jump into the questions, why don't you just, um, do you want to just share a little bit about, again, you talked about, you know, you and Sharon kind of uh, branching out also, and you have an app as well. Yeah, uh, it's uh, we we call it GHTV, and we just because it, we we do everything from from our house. It's we just have always we've had the website uh, GilbertHouse.org for I don't know seventeen years or something like that, and just within the last few years we've made that sort of our web hub where every week we produce a a, a an audio Bible study, essentially a podcast, where every Sunday we upload another edition of verse by verse exegesis of the Bible. We've been doing that since twenty fourteen. And that's really uh, provided the research for the books that we write. I mean, we got to Exodus 14 and read Moses, you know, God told Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back. Like, wait a minute. I don't remember that from the movie. What what happened there? So that led to research. The Israelites turned around. Why did God have them turn around? Why did he tell them to go to this specific place before crossing the Red Sea? And, and things like that. So that's on our app. Sci Friday, Unraveling Revelation, my weekly podcast, A View from the Bunker, which we've been producing since 2009. Now we're going back and putting up old audio episodes of PID Radio, which was our podcast that we started in 2005, which really started this whole thing. So all of that is available at an app. You can find the link for the app at gilberthouse.org. It's a mobile app, iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle, Fire, tablets, and phones, plus a Roku channel. And uh, again, it's free. And when you download that, because it's produced by a uh, Christian company that doesn't censor what we do. Oh, there you uh, go. <laughs> you say something about, uh, you know, mandates or lockdowns or whatever. Uh, it's not going to get yanked. So, uh, you know, that's really the best way to follow our stuff is to get that app. Yes. And, and the links to Gilbert, Gilbert House Fellowship, to Unraveling Revelation, to 
the podcast to the app. It's all in the description. All the links are in the description of this video as well. So, uh, and you already gave a little teaser. So I know people want to know, what are you talking about tonight? I, uh, I, I try to give a little tease in the, uh, in the title of this video. So I, I, I'm thrilled and incredibly blessed that we're going to actually discuss some of the newest things you've been looking into and researching. And the first question we're going to look at is going to be, we're going to start off looking at Sodom and really some of the some, some of the archaeological discoveries around Sodom and what you found from scripture that really gives some inf- I think gives us more information as to what was really taking place when you talk about yeah. the sins of Sodom so I'm really excited for that then we're going to uh jump into the question about planets and is there a connection between angels and planets you know and of course uh I'm sure you will probably delve into the second coming of Saturn during that question and then you know because i got so many questions we're going to do a little rapid fire q a because i know some people have some questions they want to ask you so i, I put some together from what we got during the week so we'll do that and then i'll hopefully have a few minutes left to do some overtime and take some live questions sure. and uh have a great time so everyone buckle up and uh, as always there will be uh two live winners of, of a prize tonight i'll announce two winners of who, if you're watching live you're on at the end of the show and you mentioned terry james so today is he's up so we have the discerners book. Ah. And this is a compilation book here that I contributed to chapter two. We have many great authors, Terry James, uh, Bill Salas, Jan Markell, Dr. David Reagan, all sorts of end times topics. And I think it's going to be very relevant for tonight about having discernment in the end times, discerning the signs of the times. And I think you're, you kind of inspired me because I think this first question, which you've stumbled upon and what you, what you're digging into is really a, a excellent example of how we can, need to walk circumspectly looking around as to what's going on in the world and how does it inform us in terms of scripture and in terms of prophecy so two people will win a uh, signed copy of uh discerners and of course for our replay watchers we're trying it again we got to do it we we did it before we did it twice but we we, we've been tripping up the last two weeks but i'm doing my like challenge again so let me bring it up real quick here it is our 400 like challenge. If you're watching on replay, you didn't watch it live, you're wondering, how can I win something? I want to be a part of the fun. Well, guess what? You are a part of the fun. So here it is. If, if on any of the channels you see on my social media channels there, if any individual video gets 400 likes, make a comment. So I, obviously to demonstrate that you are in it to win it and you will win the judgment of the Nephilim prize pack. You will get the judgment of the Nephilim book. You'll get the study guide, the documentary, the t-shirt. You get everything. If we had a hat, you get a hat too, but we don't have that yet. So uh, that'll be for our replay watchers. So, all right. Now that we got that all out of the way, let's, uh, should we jump into these questions here? Absolutely. All right. So question number one, we're looking at, and, um, and I, and again, I'm really just going to kind of turn it over to you is really, we talked about, I called it the secret, uh, the spiritual uh, sin of Sodom. And so I really just wanted you to share kind of what you've been researching recently and what you've discovered and how it relates to the sins of Sodom in the book of Genesis. Cause I've always thought personally that there's much more to it than the kind of traditional church story that this is really a uh, kind of a, 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 a story that's giving, that's really speaking on the sin of homosexuality. And this is what, this is what caused God's reaction to judge the city with fire and brimstone and my position is there's much more going on than that, that you have the interaction of the of the angelic realm and that there's a lot more there going on. So uh, I was very, very excited to hear what you've been uh, looking into on that on that question. Well, this is something that Sharon and I have been uh, really curious about for a while. We wrote about it in our book, uh, Veneration, which uh, came out a few years ago, which really dealt with, uh, well, really dealt with the cult of the Nephilim. Basically, it was about the cult of the dead in and around ancient Israel and how it affected the Israelites um, spiritually and how God tried to correct them to move them away from it. Now, obviously, we know that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in the days of Abraham and Lot. And there's some question as to when that happened. Um, I had put the uh, the timeline of uh, Israelite history to where I uh, Abraham and Lot were in the Holy Land, were in Canaan in the 18th century BC. And um, that's if you only allow for 215 years of uh, Israel being in Egypt from the time of Joseph to the time of Moses and the Exodus. If you take the 430 year view, which some scholars do, that pushes obviously Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob back about 215 years. And uh, outside, 
the time of when the archaeologists working at a site in Jordan, northeast of the Dead Sea, across the river from Jericho, called Tal El Hammam, that's when they place they place the destruction of a city there, a rather large city, at about 1750 to 1700 BC. Well, this th this begs the question: Why did God find it necessary to destroy it? And later, 400 years or 215 years later, why was it necessary for uh, God to send a plague that destroyed and killed 24,000 uh, Israelites? This uh, is recounted in Numbers chapter 25, the first nine verses. That's uh, where uh, they began to worship a uh, deity, a god called Baal Peor. And it clearly had to be in the region of this area northeast of the Dead Sea. Now, let me back up and discuss the, the evidence for this uh, site called Tal El Hammam being the biblical Sodom. About 16 years ago, uh, an archaeologist who's a, a professor at Trinity Southwest University in Albuquerque began digging at this site. He was looking for a project. They had been working at a site in uh, Samaria, which the world calls the West Bank. Things got a little dicey then, Intifada, so it uh, was not really a safe place for them to dig. Uh, this was a site called Kerbet el Makader, which they believe is the biblical eye, the city that Joshua and the Israelites destroyed right after Jericho. Sure, yeah. So he's looking for another project, and he 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 told us the story actually, because we, we were at a uh, an archaeology conference that Trinity Southwest put on two weeks ago. We were there last September. They decided to have it again this year. We went back, and uh, we had the opportunity to interview Dr. Collins. He said that uh, he was leading a tour of Israel back or. or Israel and Jordan back around 2003 or four. And uh, at that time, it was sort of the accepted uh, belief that Sodom and Gomorrah were located southeast of the Dead Sea, a site called uh, Bab Ed Dra. Um, and so he's in the hotel, he said, leading the tour the night before he starts going through the book of uh, Genesis to brush up his scriptural knowledge of uh, Sodom. And he said, oh, wait a minute. The, the scriptures don't line up with the location of Bab Edra because Abraham and Lot basically were in the area of Bethel, which is north of Jerusalem, uh, hill country. And when they decide they're going to split, Lot looks up, which in the uh, vernacular of the ancient Near East means he was looking to the east. Looking up means you're looking towards the rising sun. Going to the right is south, left is is north, you know, and so on. So you can't see. Bab ed Dra, which is the southeastern corner of the Dead Sea from Bethel. Bethel is north and west of the Dead Sea. But when you look up from there, you can see the well-watered plain, the Jordan Valley, north of the Dead Sea. And so he started looking for sites, megalithic sites that, uh, or, or well, sites that look like they might house an ancient city. And there was this big hill that it kind of extends out into the valley about eight miles northeast of the Dead Sea. It's pretty much directly across from Jericho. And no one had ever dug there because it's so big. They thought, okay, that's just a that's just a hill. That's too big to be a natural tell or tall in the Arabic. But they went up there and they started looking around and they was like, wait a minute, we've got like Bronze Age pottery up here. Right. And stuff. Yeah. So they started digging. And uh, 15 years later, They've excavated down to a destruction layer. They found that this city was actually massive. The, the, uh, the defensive fortifications were massive. It was uh, based on the, uh, there you go, based on what they found in terms of the, uh, the buildings and the pottery at the levels as they go down. They determined that this city was continuously occupied from about 4000 BC, which is the end of the Copper Age, the Caucolithic, down right. to the time oh. of Abraham in the uh, Middle Bronze Age. And so from 4,000 B.C. down to about 1,700 B.C., give or take, it was continuously occupied. In fact, it was the only city continuously occupied in the southern Levant, which is Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, uh, for that entire period. Because around 2,300 B.C., there was a climate change, and uh, the climate dried up. The cities couldn't support people anymore, and uh, they basically were abandoned. People had to become nomads in order to follow the water, except at this site, Tal El Hammam, because there's a spring that flows continuously year round and then leads down to the valley, which is why it's a well watered well plain. Watered. Exactly. To give you an idea how big this site was compared to the sites that we've heard about 
I mean, given the importance in the Bible of Jerusalem or Jericho, uh, Dr. Collins says they could have put eight to 10 Jerusalems inside the city walls of Sodom. And wow. well, 10 to 12 Jerusalems, possibly wow. eight to 10 Jerichos. Okay, it's like 85, 85 acres inside the city walls of Sodom. Jerusalem at the time was about 10 acres and Jericho was about 12. So this was the biggest city south of Mount Hermon, except maybe for Hatzor, which is north of the Sea of Galilee. So this was a really important city. Now, by comparison, Bab ed was tiny, smaller than Jerusalem, and it was destroyed around 2300 BC when everything else in the Levant fell apart because of the uh, the climate change issue. And that and it was never a place where you were going to water your flocks and herds anyway, unlike the Jordan Valley just north of the Dead Sea. Uh, you got a spring coming from the west from Jer from Jericho and one coming down from Sodom. Right. What really convinced us was when I interviewed the director of scientific analysis there, Dr. Philip Sylvia, and he told me that when they got down to the destruction layer, where everything had been blown apart in like in one direction, like a massive explosion, pushed all the bricks and the, uh, the mud brick and the stones of the rampart walls in one direction from southwest to northeast. They found as they got to the site every morning, it was crusted over with like a white crystalline substance. Now, bear in mind, this is eight miles away from the Dead Sea. So they set, they, they took some samples and they sent it out for testing. They found that the uh, the sulfates and the salts in the stuff that they found at this site, which is 75 feet above the level of the valley, matched exactly the chemical composition of the water in the Dead Sea. Amazing. So you got there's a lot more evidence there that uh, they go yeah. into, but that that cinched it for us. Absolutely. Um, it also would help explain a couple of things. When Moses and the Israelites got there, and we'll say 400 years later. They uh, camped at a place that they called Shittim, or Abel Shittim. And Shittim means acacia. Well, they did some soil samples down in the valley, and they found that uh, at the levels, when they got down to the Bronze Age level, the salt content in the soil eight miles north of the Dead Sea was so high that nothing could germinate. So, And it, it stayed that way. It gradually leached out of the soil until about 700 years later, around the time of David, they were able to start farming the area again. But in the time of Moses, 400 years before David, the only thing that would grow there was acacia because it's salt tolerant. So suddenly we have a re okay, all right, well, that would explain it. Meadow of the acacias, nothing grows there except acacia because it can deal with the salt content. Right. Second, suddenly, if you imagine an explosion over the Dead Sea that was so powerful, it sucked up all of this salt water, which was like, what, 30% or 36% salt, and scattered it across 8 or 10 miles of the valley floor up to a height of 75 feet, the city of Sodom. Suddenly, we have an explanation for the story of Lot's wife. Exactly. Oh, this is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. The they made up. She turned around. She got hit with a, a, a blast. Yeah. Of 700 mile an hour, that's what they estimate the wind speed was from this blast, which wow. is like three times more powerful than the most powerful tornado on record. Yeah, uh, hit with a wave like a, a blast of superheated saline. Yeah, she became a pillar of salt instantly. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, wow, so, that's really good. Well, this is what's going on at Sodom, and in the days Amazing. of Lot, we we know the story. The angels who came to warn Lot and his family to get out of town. The men of the city wanted to know them in the biblical sense, and we believe it's because they, the people of Sodom, the men of Sodom, realized that these men were, were special in some way. These were divine. They were supernatural. And if right. we can somehow dominate, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But somehow they thought they could imbue the power from these, uh, from these visitors. More than that, I, I think we were looking at... Um, what was being worshipped at Sodom? They've gotten down to uh, the ex the expedition has gotten down to the level where they've excavated the foundations of the temple. And I noticed as we were writing the book Veneration, I, I had remembered something when I, I I read Dr. Collins' book back in 2015. So we got a promo copy at Skywatch TV. Sadly, we never had him up to interview him, which would have been awesome. But he mentioned just in passing 
that uh, at the base of the city of Sodom were 1,500 dolmens. Only about 500 exist now, but they estimate 1,500 dolmens. Now, dolmens... Can, yeah, I was, I was about to say, yeah, can you explain what, yeah. what, they, what they are? It, it's a, it's a word that comes from uh, Britonic. It, th th this is it. It's a, it comes from a Britonic word, a Celtic word that means table, because they generally look like megalithic tables, two big or three big vertical slabs, and then a, a, a capstone across the top. They're found all over the world, which is why you've got a Celtic word for it, because um, the British soldiers who stumbled onto them in the uh, Jordan Valley in the middle of the 19th century remembered seeing some in Ireland. So they're in Ireland, they're in England, they're in the, the Caucasus, they're in Korea, uh, they're, they're in Israel, but there are more of them clustered in Israel between Mount Hermon and the Dead Sea than anywhere on earth. There's an estimated 25,000 of these things. The oldest ones are near the Dead Sea, which is where ancient Sodom was located. The newer ones are up in the north in the Golan Heights. And maybe we can you know, talk about that uh, later on, but oh, specifically yeah. around Bashan, right? I mean, it's Aga Bashan yes. country. That's there. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's definitely Nephilim exactly. territory. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Those are the newer ones, but the oldest yeah. ones are found down around Sodom. And there were 1,500 of them, more of them clustered around that city than anywhere else in the Jordan Valley. So Dr. Collins just kind of mentions this in passing, like, oh, yeah, okay, Dolman's. <laughs> and Karen and I, when we were started researching the Rephaim, as because we started pulling on this thread, you know, because it's it's a mystery. We want to figure it out. Uh, led to the writing of the book Veneration. Um, you've got to talk about the Dolmans because these these are megalithic funerary monuments. Scholars don't know exactly what they were for, but they agree they had something to do with the dead. Now, were they were they tombs? Were they monuments? There's disagreement there. It appears that in the north north of the Yamuk River, which uh, enters the Jordan just south of uh, the Sea of Galilee, comes in from Jordan and Syria. Uh, in in the, the, the Golan Heights, ancient Bashan, it looks like they may have been used as tombs. But in the south, they were not. Um, and this relates to the interview that we got to do with Dr. Collins just a couple of weeks ago. Now, in our book, Veneration, we wrote about the connection between all of those dolmens at the base of... Um, Sodom and the cult of Baal Peor or Baal Peor. The Israelites were drawn into that in Numbers 25. Um, Israelite prince, Midianite princess, in the sight of Moses and all Israel, performed some sort of a rite. Um, and Phineas, this grandson of Aaron, was so outraged he took a spear and he speared them both. And there's only a couple of physical positions they could have been in for him to get them both with one. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. It was probably a fertility rite. Uh, in yeah. fact, the word, uh, the, the, the scripture says he stabbed the woman through her belly. And that word belly uh, can mean specifically the, the pelvic region. So yeah. it's probably a fertility rite. But exactly. as we start, okay, who was Baal Peor? Because he's only mentioned there, really. The word Peor, according to scholars, probably derives from a Hebrew word that means cleft or gap or opening, as in the Lord of the opening to the netherworld. Right. Or as we're going to put it in our forthcoming book we're working on now, The Gates of Hell, Lord of the Gates of Hell. So a cult of the dead connected here somehow. Well, how does this relate to how does this really relate to the Dolmans? We we had a chance to talk to uh, Dr. Collins a couple of weeks ago, and uh, in the interview about Sodom, we said, well, look, we've, we've talked with Dr. Sylvia, who's the director of scientific analysis, and he's given us an interview and talked about all the scientific evidence, so we've, we've covered that. We want to talk about the Dolmans. And so he said, well, okay. What they found, they found three Dolmans. Now, they've not published this yet, specifically. They've, they've put this in some of their seasonal reports. At the end of the uh, dig season, they'll go back to the uh, university, they'll sort through the pottery, and then they'll write up a report. Here's what we did in season 12. And in a couple of those, they uh, wrote up some of what they found. And I saw you put an image up here recently. This is what, That was some of what they'd found inside yeah. one of the dolmens. Now, almost all of the dolmens in the Jordan Valley, well, everywhere really, have been robbed out. Treasure hunters will dig into the dolmens and try to find whatever they can and sell it on the antiquities market, the black market. But they found three dolmens at the base of ancient Sodom that had not been robbed out. And we didn't know that because I thought they'd all been 
robbed out. Now, what you're seeing here on the screen, this is some of what they got out of one of the dolmens. And they found, to their surprise, that even though some of the oldest dolmens in the area appear to date back to the end of the Copper Age, the Caucolithic period, which is around 4000 BC, they found bits of pottery that they can confidently date to the time of Abraham and Lot, the Middle Bronze Age, which means they were used continuously for probably 2,000 years, maybe 2,500 years for the same sort of rituals. And they were not used as tombs. What they found were grave goods, offerings, bits of pottery, um, maybe some, uh, some olive oil, maybe a drink offering, yep. and a bone, perhaps a bone of, uh, of a, an ancestor, because they did find tombs, shaft tombs, in the area. These are basically just shafts dug into the earth, and they would put the, uh, the dead in them. They would perhaps put them on top of the dolmen until, you know, sky burial, I guess they call it, until they were defleshed by um, birds, you know, ravens, vultures, whatever. And once they'd been defleshed, then put them in the tomb. But then apparently once a year, there would be some sort of a ritual where they would go to the tomb, remove a bone, and then take some offerings, beads, pottery, um, whatever, and place it in the dolmen. And this went on because, again, this city was continuously occupied right, right. for more than 2,300 years. Yeah, so yeah. We, we have to unpack this. because this is a, You just dropped a lot of really good <laughs> revelation on, 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 on the show. So basically, essentially, if we, if we kind of look at it from the big picture, this dolmen or the dolmens that they're untouched, like that pottery, that's basically pottery that hasn't been has not been touched for a for millennia, right? right? From the right. time going back to the days of Abraham and Lot. Yeah. And contrary to the con to the common perception that these were just basically tombs, this this was serving uh, these were places of worship, at right. least in the Jordan Valley, in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, in the surrounding cities. Right. And again, combining with what we see in the book of Numbers. With this, this, uh, with this fertility right, that is it possible? Are we saying that it's possible then that what was really going on in Sodom was much more than just fornication and lust? This was actually a, a cult ritual for the purposes of accessing the supernatural realm, the fallen angelic realm, trying to again tap into that power. And then you, you know, and, and when I think about it too, just listening, you know, just in the few minutes that we spoke about this before the program. You got my, my my wheels going. I was thinking, wow, you know, you think about the comparisons that, you know, God, of course, visits Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ visits Abraham the chapter before to warn and tells him, it reveals what he's going to do. But, you know, the, the way that the Lord describes and says that, that the sins of Sodom, they cry, I heard them from heaven, they cry up to heaven. And now God has come down, you know, so what is that to me? I thought of Tower of Babel. Where mm -hmm. God says, let us go down and confound the language where it, it's something right. so serious and so severe that God has to personally come to earth into the human realm to stop it. And yeah. so, and I think, of course, again, when we think of Tower of Babel, of course, again, I believe, I believe uh, that there was a much, you know, there was a supernatural purpose to the construction project. It wasn't just to make a skyscraper. It was right, to get right. to access the, the angelic realm, the, the spiritual realm. And I saw, I think, so, so what you're saying is that this is what was really going on in Sodom. It was way more than just fornication, way more than homosexual relations. This was about fertility rights and accessing the spirit realm. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, more than just this fertility, right? It's it's that they were uh, a, a, this cult of the dead. And, and this yeah. is confirmed in Psalm 106, verse 28, which explains that it wasn't the fertility right that made God angry, so angry that he sent a plague that killed 24,000 Israelites. It reads, then they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds, and a plague broke out among them. It was the eating the sacrifices offered to the dead that provoked God to anger. Now, who wow. were the dead? Not really the spirits of the dead ancestors. These were the demonic spirits of the Nephilim, the giants destroyed in Noah's flood. I think, and this was the speculation we put forth in the book Veneration, and I reiterated this in my book Second Coming of Saturn, that I we think the, the Baal of Peor, the Lord of the opening to the netherworld, the Lord of the gates of hell, is this character referred to as Shemiyaza in the book of First Enoch, 
as El by the Canaanites, as Molech by the Hebrews, as Asher by the Assyrians, Enlil by the Akkadians and Babylonians, Dagon by the Amorites and Philistines, Kronos, Baalhamon, Saturn, and I think he's the entity that uh, comes out of uh, the pit in Revelation 9, the angel of the bottomless pit of Abaddon or Apollyon. Uh, so I think, and I think actually that the uh, connection to uh, the Tower of Babel also relates to this entity because this is post-flood, Babel is post-flood. Who is in the abyss? Well, the uh, Shemiyaza and his colleagues, the watchers, the sons of God from Genesis chapter 6. I think there's a connection between the Tower of Babel and the Temple of Enki, the god of the city of Eridu in southern uh, southern Mesopotamia. This would be southeastern Iraq today. Uh, Enki was the, the clever god, the god of um, uh, magic and, and supernatural. Sure. And uh, he uh, originally had all of the, um, uh, the, the principles of human civilization called the Mez until they were stolen by Anana or Ishtar. Uh, his niece, she got him drunk and uh, he fell asleep and she ran off with the mez. Anyway, uh, Enki's temple was called the Eabzu or House of the Abyss. So if this temple, which is known from a uh, uh, the archaeological dig done by uh, scholars in 1949 at Eridu, uh, they found 18 levels of this temple, uh, the oldest ziggurat in Mesopotamia, and it would have been the largest larger than the great ziggurat of Ur for the moon god, larger than the temple of uh, Marduk in Babylon, but it was never completed. According to the archaeologist report, right at the end of the Uruk period of history, which ended around 3100 BC, the temple was abandoned before it was completed. The final phase, level one, would have been the largest ziggurat in all of Mesopotamia. It wow. was abandoned and suddenly, just very quickly, covered over with sand. Yep. yep. Yeah, confounded. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like they were confounded. <laughs> Amazing. Well, what, yeah. What were they trying to do over the abyss? Could they have literally built a, maybe, maybe not. God, God found it necessary to interrupt whatever it was they were doing. Exactly. exactly. I think connected to the same worship of this old entity, Enlil, El, Molech, Saturn, Kronos. Yeah. I think, and, and it, it didn't dawn on me until after I'd written the book. It's like, you know, one, one of those light bulbs that should have gone on months before. God put this entity and his colleagues in chains in gloomy darkness. That's how they're described by Peter and by Jude. Absolutely. Satan is still walking the earth. So this entity, the chief of the watchers, Shemiyaza, God did, did God see him as more dangerous, a more uh, imminent threat to his creation than Satan? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, and what they did was so severe, right? I mean, that's and then you see it, and and and, and the flood on top of that, right, <laughs> you know, right. that, that dragged them down to the abyss. So uh, yeah, so I think you're really onto something. And like I said, you you really got me thinking. I wanted to throw some things out at you because I think that we actually see even other examples that kind of support your interpretation here in scripture. So I want to just look at some uh, an example at, from the. Uh, the book of Second Kings from the reign of King Josiah. And mm -hmm. so, of course, King Josiah came in. He was the boy king, came in at eight years old. And we won't go through the whole passage, but this for those who are listening in. is Second Kings 23, and this is verses 2 and 3. And this is when he's instituting a revival. He's getting rid of the occult practices that have been plaguing Israel. And so you see some of the things he's doing here. It says, you know, that he, he read the scriptures to all the people, small and great. He stood by pillar. They made a covenant to basically commit to the commandments and statutes that were written in the book of the law. And so this is, again, a time of revival. And I found some some really interesting details here. So I'm going to go ahead from verses two and three and go on to verses four and five. And this is where the revival begins. And so it says here that the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest and the priests of the second order. And the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. Right. Which about, and so then it says that and he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried out the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense, incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem. 
them also that burn incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets. Mm -hmm. Already a preview for our second question, and to all the host of heaven. So they were worshiping again and venerating not just the sun, the moon, and the stars, but also the planets. And then here, as we get to verses six and seven, it gets really interesting because it says again that he he brought the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron and burned it in the brook Kidron. So he's destroying every occult iconography that's in the country. Mm -hmm. And it says that uh, he ground them to powder. But then it continues in the highlight section says, and he break down the houses of the sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women were hanging, wove hangings for the grove. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Himon, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Molech. Mm. So here I found it interesting that you, they talk about the, the house of the sodomites. And of course, here it's not, I don't think it's an ethnic identification. I think it's referring again to those who are doing these occult kind of fertility, fornication rituals for the purpose of actual occult practice, not just for lust. So this was about, again, accessing the spirit realm, and it connects it to these women who are weaving hangings for the grove, for these groves that would uh, house the idols and house these demonic uh, forces and these 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 kind of icons and, and figures to the idols. And it connects it also to Moloch. So you see this whole connection, again, of Sodom, ritual, Moloch, the planets, mm -hmm. stars, mm -hmm. all connected. So I, I just really, it really, I was like, you know, so, so what are your, what are your thoughts there? Well, the, one of the other things I noticed is that he carried the ashes to Bethel and yes. uh, it was <laughs> likely to desecrate the high place at Bethel because remember uh, it, later, well, pr previously Jeroboam, after yep. he uh, split away the Northern kingdom had um, set up a, uh, golden calves golden to calf. uh to to uh at bethel and at dan and, and there's some debate as to who the god was that uh, was being worshipped there there are those who say that okay these these are just representations of yahweh but of course he wasn't supposed to be represented by idols and so that's what his sin was but i i think i think there's more than that uh at, at work here bethel means the temple of El or the house of El. And again, I argue in the second coming of Saturn that El and Molech are the same. Uh, in fact, there was a scholar who did some really good work. He was looking at the uh, the available names from the kingdom of Ammon. And uh, Second Kings tells us that uh, uh, Solomon built a high place on the Mount of Olives for Milcom, who was the abomination of the Ammonites. He was the national yes. god of the Ammonites. Yep. But then later you see that it's referred to as Molech. Well, Milcom, Molech, basically same word in different languages. In Ammonite, Milcom is like the Hebrew Melech. It just means king. So this scholar, in looking at the names of the Ammonites, all of the names in the ancient world had a theophoric element, a god name that was part of the name, like Hezekiah, Yah, or Micah-El. Right. Yes, yeah. He said, well, okay, the national god of Milcom, you'd think that the or national god of the Ammonites being Milcom, you'd find a lot of name of Am, Am, names of Ammonite kings and uh, prominent people with Milcom as part of the name, but that's not the case. You find the most popular theophoric element among the Ammonites is El. Milcom was just his title. They just called him king. So El was the national god of the Ammonites, which means Milcom, Molech, is El. Now, the main epithet or nickname of El in the Canaanite literature is Bull El. Bull El. In fact, the prophet Hosea condemning the golden calves that Jeroboam put up at Bethel and at Dan. Uh, there's a verse in Hosea 8, verse 6. Uh, let's see. How does it go? For it is not from Israel a craftsman made it. Um, yeah, for it is not from Israel a craftsman made it, but the actual Hebrew literally reads for from Israel, not it is from Israel, just for from Israel, which makes no sense. Right. Scholar pointed out that uh, when you regroup the consonants, because Hebrew has no vowels, yep. you actually get for it is bull L, a craftsman made it. So wow. Hosea was condemning Jeroboam, who was leading Israel back to the worship of L. And of course, Beth L, the house of house El, of, or of Temple of El. El, and Dan, which is at the foot of Mount Hermon, which was believed to be the place where El held court with Asherah, 
and their 70 sons. So, yeah, Josiah taking the ashes to Bethel was making a statement. Okay, Moloch, exactly. you want to burn stuff? We're going to desecrate your high place here at Bethel. Exactly. And speaking of Asherah, uh, you know, another example that came to mind uh, as we talk about this connection uh, is in the book of Acts. And so this also this also was very interesting. So this here is uh, in Acts 19. And this is interesting because it says Paul is empowered by God, the Apostle Paul, to do special miracles. And so here we see that he's he's healing people, you know, that the, the sick can just touch you know, handkerchiefs or aprons and they're, they're healed by him. And then we get this account of these sons of Sceva. And it says mm. that uh, a Jew in, ch in chief of the priests, which did so. And it says that, that, that they were trying to cast out demons. They're trying to be basically be exorcists. And so they, they, his sons, the sons of this, of this man Sceva try to cast out a demon up out of a demon possessed man. And it says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And that's Acts 19, 11 to 16. So they have this encounter where they, they clearly fail at casting out the demon. But in the demon proclaiming, I know Jesus, I know Paul, it actually led to revival. Because as you continue, it says that, and this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified because that that proclamation, even by a demonic spirit, told people, wow, this Jesus is real. He is who, the, who they claim he is. And so it says that many believed and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deed, made them also which use curious art. So these, these are the occult practitioners in Ephesus brought their books together and burned them before all men. You know, again, shades of Josiah taking the occult articles and just burning them. And they uh, counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, which we know, of course, in modern money is a very large sum of money. Mm -hmm. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. And it says, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain into the craftsmen, unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation said, sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. So here you have the temple of Diana and what are they doing? They're making shrines. It's like the women who are weaving, you know, the weaving hangings for the grove of the Asherah, right? And so again, we see that even, even 700, 800 years later, this practice has is continued in the mm -hmm. heart of Diana worship in Ephesus. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that really stood out when we were um, researching uh, veneration. And again, the second coming of Saturn is the connection between soothsaying, uh, consulting the spirits, necromancers and mediums to get information from the spirit realm and the practice of burning children, offering them a sacrifice to Molech. This this was explicitly tied together in Leviticus 20 and uh, Deuteronomy 18, I believe, uh, you've got connections there where God makes it very clear that uh, you are not to do these things. You are not to consult necromancers or mediums, and the connection is, uh, in every case, tied to the um, tied to the practice of uh, of child sacrifice. It is. Um, let's see here. I'm going to find this. Yeah, Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 through 12, and Leviticus uh, 20 verses 1 through 6. The uh, the, the list of things that they weren't supposed to do. If a person turns to mediums and necromancers, whoring after them, I will set my face against that person, will cut him off from among his people. Uh, God goes so far as to say, if a man gives one of his children a Moloch and do not put him to death, the people do not close their eyes to the man who puts, burns his child a Moloch. Uh, I will set my face against that man and against his clan and will cut them off from among their people. There, there's a connection. Again, it's the worship of the, the deceased ancestors or what people thought were their dead ancestors. Again, the demonic spirits of the Nephilim. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I think there's a, I think there's an end time uh, connection as well. Uh, and when you talk about provoking God. And so uh, another thing that, that you, when you inspired me <laughs> um, today to start d d diving into scripture uh, after you, after you shared this amazing um, kind of interpretation with me was, um, Deuteronomy 32, 
Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We always talk about Deuteronomy 32, God dividing the nations among the, the angels of God. But that but Moses continues with a prophecy, I believe, of the end times apostasy and redemption of Israel and the vengeance of Israel's enemies by God. And uh, if you look at some of the passages, it's almost everything you were just talking about here. So, you know, here it says they provoked him, provoked Yahweh to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. And here's this also interesting. Look, look what it says as, as Moses continues. It says, for their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being their, being judges. And so I believe that the rock of the of God's people is the Messiah. Jesus is our mm -hmm. rock. So who is their rock? I believe this is a prophecy foretelling the Antichrist. When Israel, the unsaved remnant, the, 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 the two-thirds who will not be a part of the believing remnant, they will trust in the false rock. They rock. And, the, and then it continues and says, for their vine, right? Jesus said, he's the vine. Mm -hmm. He says, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of mm -hmm. the fields mm -hmm. of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of apps. We're seeing all these references to Sodom, the dragon, Satan. Yes. So yes. Again, this is all talking about the Antichrist. It, all, it, it, in the final analysis, he's the fulfillment of the vine of Sodom, you know, the worship of, of Antichrist. And That's so, good. Uh, yeah, so um, and of course it ends by saying God's he's gonna avenge his people, he'll be but ultimately he'll be merciful. So that's why I believe this is end times because God's gonna exact his vengeance in the great tribulation, but that one third remnant, of course, is gonna be saved and brought through the fires of the of the great tribulation and and redeemed. Yeah, yeah. Boy, that, yeah, that is good. And I, I love the way that verse uh, concludes, verse 43. Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods. A amen. Amen. That's right. That's right, because the and, and that's a great point too. Is it, ultimately, it's going to be the judgment of not just unbelieving humanity, but of the all the false gods, all the idols, the fallen angelic realm, the demons. They're all going to be punished in the great tribulation. And uh, one last thing I just wanted to share was that you can see here again that in the end times, what do we see? The worship of the actual of the dragon. So mm -hmm. you see that their rock is going to lead them to. The dragon, that people are going to be worshiping Satan, Revelation 13, 4, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Revelation 9, you know, this is after the punch. We talked about the abyss being open, about this being returning, Shemiazah, Apollyon, Abaddon, the same being returning and tormenting, yet and still people don't repent. Revelation 9, 20 to 21, and the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, uh, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And again, that's Revelation 9, 20 to 21. So again, you see the full in the end times, what's going to be practiced? Sorcery, the occult, the worship of Satan. So the Antichrist, I believe, is the rock, the other rock. And the mm -hmm. vine of Sodom ultimately is going to lead people back to the worship of the devil himself. Yes, yes, this is uh, this is really good stuff. You know what's really fascinating here, and I, I wish I'd, I'd seen this, but uh, we'll have to credit you then when we incorporate this into uh, our forthcoming book. <laughs> because, no, this is really good. Uh, and the verse that I, I mentioned, by the way, this uh, Deuteronomy thirty-two forty-three, they. Uh, the uh, translators of the ESV, which is what I'm looking at here, they go back to the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, which has that verse, Rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods. That's not in the, uh, the Masoretic text, which is what most of our English Old Testaments are based on. But I think that really fits the, the context here. What was really fascinating is that right after this prophecy that Moses issues, connecting the... Uh, the the uh, the grapes of the the vine of Sodom and the the fields of Gomorrah the grapes the grapes of poison the poison of dragons I think that's the correct translation Tananim um, right after Moses does that verse forty eight of Deuteronomy thirty two God says to Moses go up this mountain of the Avarim Mount Nebo and Avarim is the Hebrew word that translates as travelers which is the term the Canaanites oh, use right. for the spirit yeah. of wow. the Rephaim. 
And from there, he got his only look at the promised land. But from there, you can also look over to about the two o'clock position. And there's that little hill <laughs> out into the valley, ancient Sodom, ancient Sodom. Now, here's the thing that uh, Dr. Collins mentioned as we come back to Sodom again, that uh, this, in fact, was proposed back in the 1930s by an archaeologist by the name of Nelson Glick, who did the first real systematic uh, survey. Well, say post-World War I, I mean, the uh, the Brits had a lot of archaeologists working in uh, Palestine back in the late 19th century. They were really scouting for the foreign office because they knew the Ottoman Empire was collapsing and they were wanting to see what they could get their hooks into. Uh, but they did some really good archaeology too, men like uh, Charles Warren and Claude Condor and H.H. H. Kitchener and, and many others. Anyway, Glick traveled to Tal El Hammam and visited the site and noted, yeah, hey, looks like there was a big city here. Maybe this is where Moses and the Israelites camped. Maybe this is Shittim. Yeah. Now think about that. What if that was where they were camping on this site that had been devoted to this cult of the dead for more than 2,000 years until God wiped it off the earth with this meteorite blast over the Dead Sea? And they start worshiping this Lord of the dead. The, the pagan practices had continued even after that city was destroyed. Amazing. And they were right there on the city where that temple had once stood. Um, amazing. Amazing. And when you think about even the end times, that I believe that Jesus is going to lead Israel from Edom over all the territory of Antichrist. So it's a similar type of, of just ritual, you know, just of, of establishing, of, of you know, re rebuke of everything the Antichrist has done and established. So, yeah. yeah. So amazing, yes. amazing, amazing stuff, as it was in the days of Lot. We have to remember that. It's not just the days of Noah, it's the days of oh, Lot. And right. I, think you, I think you really stumble into something amazing here. So, uh, I was going to say, it'd make a great book, but I see you're already working on it. So, yeah, <laughs> that was great. That was great. <laughs> but I appreciate you sharing that research. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And uh, we can go on, but we got to take a break because I want to get to question sure. number two. And I see there's a, a lot of comments <laughs> in the comment Wonderful. section. Wonderful. So I want to make sure we have a little time to uh, to take some live questions because there's, a, there's a, a inordinate amount of comments. People are pretty excited and, and uh, I'm sure inspired by, the, by everything you shared. So uh, we're going to take a quick break and we get back. We'll get to question number two. And I promise I'll do a few uh, questions from, uh, from, from, from those who are watching live. So we'll be right back. When we look at Genesis 6 from the supernatural perspective, it starts to answer a number of questions we see all throughout the Bible. Why would a loving God send a devastating flood that wiped out the entire global population, only leaving eight people alive? Why did the Pharaoh during the Exodus order all the male children in Israel to be executed? Okay, and that was the trailer for Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World. And for those who don't know, Judgment of the Nephilim, of course, my first book is a comprehensive uh, biblical study of Nephilim giants. A lot, of, a lot of what we were discussing today, Genesis chapter 6, why do we have a flood? Why are there angels in the abyss when the devil's not? And uh, how does it all relate to our salvation? It actually it relates in a huge way because it's all connected to the first prophecy in the Bible, Genesis 3.15 we were told that God proclaimed our redemption through the seed of the women of a woman. So it's all in Judgment of the Nephilim. You see some uh, very nice comments there from Gary Stearman and Ellie Marzulli, two people that Derek knows very well. Uh, so, yeah, so it's available, obviously, in paperback, the DVD documentary, also in Vimeo on demand, and there's study guides for it as well. So uh, we got to keep this moving. 
because uh, I don't want to get, I, I got to make my audience happy. So we're going to get to question number two and uh, we'll do that. And then we'll get to uh, at least two or three live questions. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now try to be more prompt. I'll, I'll be a little pithy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like try that. Try to be pithy. All right. So this is a question I've been asked a, a lot and um, I'm excited to have you on because I haven't touched on it at all. And um, shout out to uh, Kimberlyn, longtime watcher of Thursday Night Theology, because she asked this question months ago. And I said, I'm, I'm like, and I said, the answer is going to come. And then once I knew you were coming on the show, I, I wrote it back and said, now your answer is going to come. So uh, and this is the question about the connection between the angelic realm and planets. And so, again, um, I'll uh, just just to set the table here. You see here we have um, some scripture. So this is from Deuteronomy. Um, <clears throat> so this is actually Deuteronomy four, verse nineteen. So sorry for the incorrect citation. Here. It's actually Deuteronomy four, and in, 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 uh, in verse nineteen it says, "Lest." And this is of course God speaking. And going back to we're talking about rebuking uh, idolatrous occult behavior and practices in Israel and, and, and getting to the stars and the host of heaven, God says, unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, and shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all the nations under the whole heaven. So God is saying, do not do this. Don't look up to the sky, to the host, to the stars, the sun, the moon, uh, and the planets. And speaking of planets, here we have a quote from the second coming of Saturn, uh, of course, by Derek. And he's wrote uh, to reiterate, we identify Saturn Kronos as the watcher chief Shemiaza. And he, like the rest of the angels who sinned, is still in chains in Tartarus. And then moving on it, a little later, it says, did pagans of the classical era really look back on the pre-flood world with longing and nostalgia? Apparently so. And this desire to return to the golden age is still alive today. And of course, that again is from the second coming of Saturn. So just wanted to tee that up for you because uh, I like very definitive statements. You were like, we identify this is exactly who he is. But explain, can you can, can you kind of unpack, you know, because we see in the scripture, this connection between planets and angels just kind of you know, kind of explain that, uh, you know, for the, for the, for the viewers. Well, we have to speculate to some degree because we don't know exactly how this works, but it's our belief that, and when I say our, I'm talking not in the Royal, we, you know, me and Sharon, um, our breakfast conversations are often very much like this. Uh, we, we think that these entities identify themselves masqueraded as these, uh, uh, heavenly beings or heavenly, uh, uh, objects to the ancient world. And uh, said, yes, I am the entity uh, represented by the planet Venus, or I am the sun, I am the moon, whatever, uh, to the, the pre-flood world. And that's how God describes him in the Deuteronomy 4 passage that, that you mentioned, uh, the, the sun, the moon, and all the hosts of heaven, and uh, you know, bow down and worship them, things that he allotted to the nations. He basically, after the Tower of Babel incident, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, when he divided the nations, he numbered them according to the number of the sons of God. Well, apparently these are the entities who then decided they would represent themselves to people as, you know, the, the visible planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and uh, the sun and the moon. And of course, the stars at night, all the hosts of heaven. Um and Isaiah even says in Isaiah, it was a 24 where uh, he will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of earth on earth. And the sun and the moon will be uh, shut up in a pit and after many days uh, will be punished. So, you know, God describes him in sort of those same terms. And I think it was partly that he was reaching out to Moses and Isaiah and their, the, the Israelites where they were. Yeah. But, but we also see references to things like the stones of fire in Ezekiel 28, which is a reference to Eden. You know, the rebel from Eden who was tossed out, who I believe was Shemiyaza and not Satan, um, was described as walking among the stones of fire. Well, in the book of Enoch, first Enoch, I think around chapter 21, I don't know that's that book quite as well as the Bible, and I'm no expert of the Bible either. Uh, but uh, he is taken into the netherworld and he's shown seven burning mountains and he asks his angelic guide, who are these? Well, these are the angels who uh, kept not, uh, who came out and didn't come out at their appointed times, so or they sinned, and they're going to be punished here for 
you know, some extended period of time, but they're described as burning mountains. So when we look at Revelation and John talks about a burning mountain falling into the sea and then wormwood falling into the sea, the question is, are we dealing with an entity or with a space rock? And the answer could be yes to both. Don't know. But isn't it amazing, yeah. isn't it amazing how the Holy Spirit works? You know, I, I said I said just last week I was saying how the Holy Spirit is the executive producer of this show. So, <laughs> so now I got now I got a surprise for you. Now that you just mentioned this, so there's such an amazing point. So here's what I here's what you know, again, having just a few minutes we spoke, which you got me really thinking about. And I'll so I'll, I'll bring this up for you and tell me what you think about this. So let's see here. Okay, so here's one. Here's well, this 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 was this is one example here, of course, where Paul and uh, Barnabas are actually called Jupiter and Mercury that we see in Acts chapter 14. But let's let's uh, you know, we talked before about you know Acts 19. You know, this whole thing with the the, the silversmiths and the temple to Diana who are making the shrines of silver to Diana. You know, later on in that passage, there's an interesting little excerpt in that passage where. This is where this is what just came to my mind. So here again, continuing Acts 19, you have Alexander now who comes in. They're trying to basically bum rush the Apostle Paul in this in this theater. And Alexander, a fellow a Hebrew, comes in to try and make peace. And he says to the people, he says, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of, of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. And that's like Acts 19, 35 to 36. And so he references this image that fell from the planet Jupiter. Well, you know, here's a quote here from a, a 19th century commentary. It's actually a Christian magazine called The Quiver. And it says the image, this image that fell from Jupiter, uh, it says the image that was worshipped in the splendid temple of Diana at Ephesus was doubtless a meteoric stone of this kind. It probably fell from the sky in the very place where the temple was afterwards built. And some, and it had some rude likeness, which it presented to a woman's figure, especially when subsequently improved by carving, suggested that it was the image of Diana made in heaven itself by the hands of the great ruler of the gods. And again, that's from the quiver in 1890. Now, now get this. There is a uh, uh, there was a myth or belief among the Greeks. We call it myth, but it was actually their religion. They believed that when Uranus, the sky god, who is the equivalent of Anu in Mesopotamian religion and Kalos in the Roman religion, when he was fighting against uh, Kronos and the Titans, threw rocks from heaven that wow. landed on the earth and created the tried to create an army of these stones to defeat uh, Kronos and the Titans. It wasn't successful, but these stones were called Betilia by the Greeks, okay? Okay. Betilia, uh, which is very near the Hebrew Beit El, which means the temple or house of El. Beit yeah, El. Yeah, yeah, wow. And they were worshipped all over the Mesopotamia. In fact, when you go to Petra, the sure. uh, those uh, – have you been? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> we're going to have to change that. Uh, <laughs> Um, because they've got these carved um, images that are in these niches all throughout Petra. They've, they've estimated like 550 of them. Scholars call them beetles, B-E-T-Y-L-S. But it's from the Greek Betilia, which is from the Hebrew Beit El or Beth El. Remember, Jacob set up a stone there. Of course, yeah. Dream. So again, there was a site. Now, what happened was the pagans took the idea. Jacob set up a memorial stone to mark the place where he'd seen angels ascending and descending from heaven. Sure. But they began worshiping the stones as though they housed the entities or exactly, with morality yeah. to the gods. So Which that's is always the lore of idolatry, right? Like just like you, yeah. just like you talked about, like, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of uh, real biblical credibility to what you're saying, because, you know, we're told in scripture, the devil masquerades, his ministers masquerade. So whether they say, hey, the power is actually in the stone, it's not in the it's not in the true God, it's in the stone itself, that's where the power is, or they just present themselves and say, I am Mercury, I am Saturn, I am Jupiter. It's really just a deception. It's just a deception. Mm -hmm. And so that's just great, great points. And on that, on that same note, 
as you speak of God's ascending and descending, I have something else I want to show you too that also came to my mind was, and this, this, I don't know if you'd be familiar. I'm sure you probably heard of it because I know you're a sci-fi fan. I don't know if you ever saw there's a movie that was called Jupiter Ascending. Uh, so I've seen bits and pieces of it. It was about it was by the Wachowski uh, brothers, now siblings, who made the Matrix film. They made this much later. Yeah. And so this is, I actually haven't seen this film, but I've read extensively on it. It's an, it really interesting because the plot of the film is that basically this alien race uh, lives on some planet. It's ruled by this royal family. And they basically make all of their wealth by seeding these pr like primates on the planet Earth that evolve into humans and then they actually wipe out the whole population to use the humans for to make a, 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 a basically their bodies to make a serum for immortality. So they live <laughs> forever by using human beings. So and and hum, it, and on Earth, it's like it's like normal Earth, modern Earth today. No one even knows they exist. And so and so the whole uh, crux. The, and and so gene, but genetic it, on the so among the gods, right? The aliens they're living with high technology. Everyone's doing DNA manipulation. Some people are part wolf, part human. They're mixing them. They're doing all sorts of mingling of seed. And then, of course, in the film, there's a character. You see the, the female there whose name is Jupiter Jones, who's living on Earth. She's like a, a maid, you know, working in a, in, a, in a real tough job. She's, you know, someone of no of not any note. She it turns out that she has part of the DNA of the alien race and she's the hybrid savior of the earth ah, okay yes yeah, so. <laughs> yeah there, there's yeah. more truth in that movie than the uh than the brothers knew it, it, exactly yeah. also i also think that it was interesting too that I, I felt the title is very similar to a much older film called lucifer rising i'm like it seems it's a little coincidental they called it jupiter ascending mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's so many connections between jupiter and satan right and so right. uh yeah so um yeah jesus so I, I, it also oh, just came to mind uh yeah. In discussing these things but um but yeah i think ultimately it, it comes back to deception mm -hmm. absolutely and, and, and in the end times can be no different or we see that whether it's as planets whether it's as extraterrestrials from another planet right that that is the devil is going to use unprecedented deception and that's what the lord warns us of in matthew 24 so mm -hmm. um so yeah, so yeah, so I I, I agree. I, I agree wholeheartedly that that the angels are representing themselves as plants in ancient times. This is exactly what they did. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's interesting, you know. If I can plug Sharon's series of novels, the Red Wing Saga. She uh, is just finished novel number eight in that series, but uh, the uh, Watcher class entities, rebellious Watcher class entities, and faithful ones play important roles throughout the series. And uh, there are a couple who masquerade as the sun and the moon, uh, very interesting, uh, characters. Um, and, and again, kind of speculative because we don't really know how this works. The Bible's not right. explicit there, but, uh, it's, it's fascinating to imagine how they must see us, uh, and how they must feel about humanity, knowing that we've been told that we will judge angels someday that, you know, we we were really excited to find out that uh, Timothy Alberino was seeing this parable the same way we do the parable of the uh, uh, the prodigal son. We we are the prodigal son. I mean, yes, it's a it's a parable about the importance of forgiveness, but we are the ones who've been given this wonderful inheritance called Earth and given the the order to go forth, to be fruitful, and multiply, and take dominion to this planet, and um, we squandered it. And right. we're reduced to serving the the swine herd, the guy who keeps the pigs, the unclean animal. Oh, oh, we lost Eric. He's on. A, he was on a roll. So uh, hopefully he'll come back uh, in a moment. But in the meantime, I think uh, I think I know where he was going with that. So that that again, that the prodigal son, that basically obviously humanity, we gave up the incredible blessing that God gave us in Eden to give us dominion over the earth and squandered it and wasted all of our inheritance. And of course, in salvation through Christ, what does God do? Puts a robe on us, puts a ring on us, prepares a meal for us, the feast. We see the great supper, right? In the great tribulation, that there's the marriage supper of the lamb. Of course, all this is just beautiful 
typology of our redemption and of the second coming of Christ. And so, uh, all right, looks like Derek is, uh, I think he is back. Let's see if we can get him back in the room. I'll give him a moment to set up his camera. I think he's coming back though. So, but uh, but yeah, it's it's beautiful, beautiful uh, typology. And I think that's a great, great point there. So um, let's see here. So so let's see. We will um, you know, I'll take Derek. You there? Yeah, I'm to the stream. All right, not yet. So um you know this is this is uh this is live tv folks this is what happens so um so what we'll do now is uh we will take a quick break and hopefully by the time derek will have his uh connection all set up and we will pr i promise we will get to some overtime questions guaranteed coming up in just a moment let's see here as we get ready for our break i think i will make this a quick break and we will just do the um The study guides. Okay, so those are the uh, study guides for Judgment of the Nephilim and the Final Nephilim. And again, those are for if you want to get deeper into the content, if you want to understand the interpretations, the etymology, the foreshadows, the typology, the ancient research, it's all in the study guides. Great for home study, group study, Sunday school, any context, it's good. If you want to, if you want to really get into it and get deep. And speaking of getting deep into the Bible, he is now returned. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, one of the uh, one of the exciting things of doing it uh, doing it live. It uh, <laughs> used to be when I did uh, my Sunday night uh, podcast live, our dachshund would always start staring at me through the door just after coming back from a break. It's like, oh, really? Now, okay, well, <laughs> the break. so God bless you for being brave enough to do this live. Yeah, you know, it's uh, God. God is on the throne. We have issues all the time. It's it's, it's all good though. You know, it's like we're like one happy family here. There, I think uh, everyone. I get a lot of grace <laughs> from the Thursday night theology audience whenever I have a, a tech issue. So it, it it's uh, it's all good. It is all good, my brother. So um, all right. So I'm gonna throw some some questions that came during the week, and as you answer them, I'll uh, we're gonna do some rapid fire, and okay. I will then also start scanning the live q a questions if there's anything you see feel free to just jump right in if there's a question that stands out to you jump right in and just read it and answer it and we'll we'll, we'll, we'll just make it work okay um so uh what is uh your position on the rapture you know pre-tribulation mid-tribulation post-tribulation uh pre-trib and it's because of the 70 weeks prophecy where 70 weeks were decreed for daniel's people and uh, the holy city presumably daniel's people means the uh, jews and if we're now in that gap between week 69 when the messiah was cut off in week 70 which is the final seven year tribulation period presumably that means the church will not be here during the final week so uh, that's where i come down on uh, on that although we're open to uh, pre-wrath and um but uh, i I, th I think the evidence points to pre-tribulation yeah, I, I agree. And let me ask you this, too, because this was also another question in one of the many people wanted to know your position on the rapture. Do you think uh, that um, any of the seals are, have been opened? Oh, yeah. We wrote about this in our book, Giants, Gods and Dragons. We believe and, and credit to our friend uh, David W. Lowe, who wrote the book Earthquake Resurrection more than 15 yes. years ago. Um, wow. We wow. think that the uh, the first five seals have been opened. I mean, when you look at the book of Acts, uh, well, go back up. When you go to Revelation uh, 4 through 6 and you see that the Lamb appears next to the throne of God and takes the scroll uh, and begins to open them, when you go back to the book of Acts and see that um, Philip, as he was being martyred, saw that uh, one like the Son of Man was at the right hand of the Father, and uh, Paul writes in a couple of his epistles that we know that uh, Jesus was at the right hand of the Father. If they knew about it then, 
within the first few years of the resurrection, it, it seems unlikely that here we'd be 2,000 years later with um, John in heaven and uh, an angel crying out, is there anyone, you know, no one has been found worthy in heaven or on earth or under the earth who's, okay, where's he been hiding for 2,000 years? No, I think we think he's <laughs> yeah. opening those deals in the first century. Yeah. I, we're, I, we're I, waiting he, for numbers. He is worthy, right? right? He, he is worthy. Jesus is worthy. I, I agree. I agree completely. And uh, an earthquake resurrection was an, uh, excellent, but can't believe it was 15 years ago. But a great, but a great, great, yeah. great book. Great, great book. That's one of my one of my favorite books. Excellent, excellent book. Very inspirational. Um, uh, and I'll do one more from the week, and then we'll just do some live questions and wrap up. What is your position on uh, the Nephilim returning after the flood? How do how do we have giants in the promised land after the flood? How did that how did that happen? In your in your estimation, well, we we take the position that there are a couple of possible answers. Number one is that there is a second incursion. Number two is that, uh, as Mike Heiser's pointed out, in Genesis six, it uh, re- where it reads, uh, "The giants were in the earth in those days when the sons of God went into the daughters of man." Uh, the word translated "when" can also be "whenever." So, second incursion, um, or here's the other possibility, which we present in the book Veneration. The words translated descendant of in 2 Samuel, or was it 1 Samuel, where David uh, and his men go out to do battle with uh, the Goliath and his buddies. 1 Samuel 18, maybe? I'd have to go back and look and find it. Uh, oh, the mighty men? The, the mighty men where they've got the five other giants, who, uh, mm-hmm. uh, including uh, Ishbi ben Ov, who, uh, who yep. almost kills David. Uh, and they're described as descendants of the giant or descendants of yes. the giants or descendant. The word translated descendant there, yellow day does not mean literal blood descendant. It is never used anywhere else in the Bible to mean that when someone is a son of someone, you know, Ben something that yes. means literal blood descendant, but the term right. yellow day, yellow day, ha Rafa uh, means one who is a member of a group into which he's been consecrated or indoctrinated. So it's a one who, uh, and this was this was based on an article from the '70s by a scholar named Conrad Larue, who argued that Goliath and his buddies, rather than being literal blood descendants of the Nephilim, were essentially members of a warrior cult that venerated the spirits of the giants. Interesting and evidence there, and I'm gonna I'm gonna find this now because it's bugging me that I should I should remember this because it's such an important point that. Um, the uh that's got to be second samuel 18 because first samuel 18 is david and jonathan anyway uh or 21 maybe anyway uh the the uh, giant that almost kills david ishbi ben ab is how yes. it looks uh brian gadawa who's an award-winning screenwriter and uh sure. has written a number of excellent fiction books based on the theology put out by Dr. Michael Heiser, pointed out that when you separate the word benab, it's ben-ov. And ov is the Hebrew word that translates as medium or necromancer, well, medium usually. But as I showed in the book, Second Coming of Saturn, better scholarship shows that that word actually means owner of a necromantic ritual pit. Hmm. When Saul went to the medium of Endor the night before he died, he visited the ov of Endor. And that word actually comes from a Hurrian word. Those are the Horites in the Bible. A Hurrian word, Abi, which refers to this necromantic ritual pit. They, there was, they found one at the ancient city of Urkesh that goes back to like 3500 BC. They dug this hole and the priest would descend into the hole, scribe a magic circle on the dirt, sacrifice a small animal like a piglet or a puppy, summon gods you know, air quotes, from the netherworld and then ask for favors. And then they would send them back to the netherworld and they would cover up the hole. That's what the medium of Endor was doing. Absolutely. Samuel, the spirit of Samuel came up from the earth. She had a ritual pit. Interesting. That's a very, that's a very unique interpretation. I I have more homework. (laughs) Writing writing fiction speculated that this Ishbi Ben Ov or Ishbi son of the medium was the son of the medium that Saul visited the night before he died. But I think what the wow. evidence points to wow. is that it means that Ishbi and his colleagues were in fact members of a demon worshiping cult. And I think that's what we're looking at 
with this cult of the dead. And that's what our book Veneration was about, this cult of the dead that surrounded ancient Israel, that uh, Isaiah was warning the Israelites to st you know, stop doing this 700 years after Moses and the Israelites had their encounter with Baal Peor. Yeah, uh, great stuff. They provoked him with other gods. Yeah, yes, that's great. So, all right, I found a question for you. Um, and this is from uh, Cindy Ann. This is a really interesting question. So any thoughts or insights on that Satan had a demon that looked like a frog come out of him in Revelation 16, 13? Um, I mean, obviously we know that happens, but we, I, I think the question is getting at, you know, it says that do, don't demons control? It seems weird that Satan would be controlled and we know that God created evil. So I think you kind of, kind of how does, you know, obviously we know that happens. A demon is going to come out of the mouth of the devil, certainly. I'm right, an antichrist right. false prophet, but what's, what do you think is going on there that they have a demons actually inside of them? I, I think what they're doing is they're sending them forth to do work in, in the same way that uh, in first Kings 22, when God uh, says to the divine council, how are we going to trick Ahab into going into battle where he'll be killed by the Syrians? And uh, one spirit says one thing, another spirit says another yeah. one says, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Okay, go ahead. You'll do it. And, and it will be, uh, you, you will succeed. I, I think it's something like that. Satan and his minions sending out these lying spirits to deceive humanity into going to war against God. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's a great example, actually. I agree that they're they're they are sent, they are ordering them. The demons are subject to them. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. 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 Yeah. All right. I got. A, I have another here for you. Um, can you talk on the angel in Revelation chapter ten? The mighty angel in Revelation 10. Let me scroll from, back that. Ron Jones asked that question. Ah, mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, his face like the sun, legs like pillar of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, right foot on the sea, left foot on the land, called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. Um, that's a really good question. Sharon and I touched on that uh, a while back during uh, our Unraveling Revelation study. Um, there is, uh, there are varying opinions on that. I mean, is that Jesus? I don't think so because, uh, yeah, a mighty angel, but I don't think he'd be described as an angel. Um, I think he is uh, one of the watcher class angels, an archangel, maybe not identified by name, but one who's tasked with, uh, delivering, uh, delivering that message, the trumpet call. So, uh, yeah, I think I think he's one of the heavenly host. Uh, clearly, a high-ranking and mighty, powerful angel. Um, but who he is exactly, we we can only guess. Yeah, uh, yeah did yeah, see a yeah, question yeah. I want to address real quick. Was it right. Samuel that actually talked to Saul? I believe Ooh. yes. Um, and there are some scholars who disagree that they think that uh, God would not have appeared to Saul or used that type of method to uh, deliver a message. But he certainly, God certainly used pagan kings like. Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar, polytheists, to uh, achieve his ends. So uh, I think if it had not been Samuel, uh, Scripture would told us it was a spirit that was pretending to be Samuel to deceive Saul. But the, everything in the Bible uh, about that incident uh, indicates that that spirit was the spirit of Samuel. I agree completely. Yeah, and I think, and I think even the fact that you know the de that's the beauty of the details of Scripture that 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 the witch herself was so scared. <laughs> But this was something yeah, unprecedented. Yeah. This was something that she had never seen or experienced before, which is why she was so scared. And um, so, yeah, so I, I, I do think it was actually uh, Samuel in, in a unique opportunity to actually speak um, in spirit form. And again, remember, we saw, we did see, you know, in the New Testament, the Mount of Transfiguration, we see Moses and Elijah are, you know, they are speaking to Jesus. So it's mm -hmm. the idea that a a godly believer can die and actually appear again on earth in spirit form is i think clearly established at the mount of transfiguration chris putnam even wrote about that in his book uh the supernatural worldview about uh, what appeared to be spirit apparitions that were allowed by god to deliver messages but um as the uh the apostle john wrote whenever we encounter spirits we are to test them because not all are from god or allowed Amen. by god some of them Amen. exercising free will are in rebellion Yep. And, and Rick, Rick Harkins just said, could that have been a familiar spirit instead? And I think to Derek's point, there are lots of scholars who do think, believe that or interpret that passage as a familiar spirit. I just think that 
Derek, I think your analysis is spot on in my estimation. So I, I, I take the position that it was Samuel. But certainly yeah, I, you will find, you know, reputable theologians who's, who believe it was a, a, a demon. Right. Or yeah. a familiar I, spirit. I, I think that if it had been her familiar spirit, I don't think she'd have cried out with a loud voice. I think she was startled because she didn't, what she saw was not what she expected. Yep. Good, good. All right. Well, unless you have anything else, we can uh, get to our prizes. Anything else that, that caught your eye? Otherwise, we will call out some winners and uh, give out some books. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, go ahead. All right. Make some I'll people some time. We can take a look. At, you, you take a look, and I'll, I'll get to our. I'll make our announcements, and we'll see if we have any time. If we're going to do any last overtime. So, our first winner again receiving a copy of Discerners. We receive an autographed copy of Discerners. Our first winner is Preston Gerard. So, congratulations, Preston Gerard. Please contact me, DM me, contact me through the website, and you can receive your prize sent to you anywhere in the world. Okay, let me just uh, put the banner up here too so you can see all the uh, social media here. The winner number two is Beth Depot. And that's Depot as in D E P O T, just like Home Depot. Beth Depot, you are the second winner. So, congratulations to you as well. You see all the social media there. You can contact me uh, anywhere and we'll send it to you um, right away. And, um, <clears throat> And also shout out to the winners of the last couple of weeks. We're finally caught up from the vacation time. I took a month off, had a wonderful time in Costa Rica. So now we're <laughs> catching up on, we have a lot of shipments to send out the door. So uh, it's all coming. So uh, thank you for your patience uh, for those who won the last couple of weeks. So uh, before we wrap up, Derek, anything else caught your eye? It's all up to you. <laughs> oh man, well, let's see. Uh, uh, we had a good question here about there with so many artifacts being found in Israel. Are we in, uh, is God revealing that we're in the last days? I think the answer to that is yes. It's the time when knowledge is increasing. Yeah. And uh, this yeah. Just some amazing things. The uh, cursed tablet from uh, Mount Eval, the uh, site of Joshua's altar, written in mm -hmm. Proto-Hebrew. But, um, uh, you know, we, we encourage people to take a look at the interviews that we've done with uh, Doug Petrovich on uh, uh, Sci Friday and my podcast about his books. Um, the uh, world's oldest alphabet and uh, origins of the Hebrews, where he shows that the Hebrews were writing a proto-Hebraic script in the 19th century BC during the time when they were in Egypt. Uh, this this is this is new stuff. Uh, there's stuff coming out now that uh, was not seen previously, and I think it uh, does relate to uh, us being closer to the time of the end. Yes, people are rushing to and fro, and knowledge is increasing. Amen, amen. I couldn't agree more. And I think I really think. You've increased some knowledge tonight with this, uh, you, you know, everything you're seeing in Sodom. Seriously, you know, that, this is good stuff. This is good stuff, man. I'm like, you got really got my wheels going. So uh, this is really, really good stuff. So I'm excited to see uh, what you and Sharon put together when you actually turn this into a full-fledged book. Because this is, I think it's really, really cutting edge uh, interpretations that, that uh, you found. And with the, archeolo the archaeological discoveries to back it up, it's just mind-blowing. So uh, I love it. This is great. and. Uh, and, uh, and that's it. Here we are. So uh, thank you again, Derek. I appreciate it. Um, I've been looking forward to this night. It's been awesome as usual. Uh, every well, time, you know, I, whenever I get a chance, whether we're eating or just talking at a conference, it's time to really geek out in the Bible. <laughs> that's what we do. That's what we do. Amen. That's what we do. So this could, do, this could easily be a four-hour program. <laughs> um, but honestly, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, uh, I, it's a it's a real treat for for the audience here, and um, I, I thank you so much. And again, for everyone, please, you, you heard, you know, now uh, that I actually live uh, in Texas and drive, I appreciate podcasts more than ever because I never ha had to drive in New York City. And so uh, I told Derek the first time I met him, I said, I listen to five and ten. All the time. it's like. Instant, instant car listening. So uh, yes, check out Side Friday, 5 and 10, Unraveling Revelation, the Gilbert House Fellowship. All the links are in the description. Get the free app. Get their content. Um, they're doing amazing work, Derek and Sharon. Shout out to Thank Sharon. You. And uh, hopefully, you know, maybe next time we'll have both of you on. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, she yeah, goes to bed that'd early, that'd though. That'd so, uh, that's, that's, that's a little tough. She goes to bed early. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, all right. All right. Well, um, either way, <laughs> thank you so much. And I appreciate everyone watching. Um, for more information, again, all the links are in the description. Please uh, follow Derek's content. Thank you once again for watching and Lord willing, see you next Thursday.